Welcome to worship on this January 10th, our second Sunday in the new year, and it's the last Sunday of the Christmas season. So this is sadly our last day with the Christmas decorations, and you'll see a little bit later a little, something more to do with that. But I um, want to welcome you if you're visiting with us, and we're glad that you're here. Look at our website and learn more about our congregation. And for those of you who are in our congregation uh, who have not yet become a member of the church, if you would like to join with me in a Zoom uh, session, a two-session uh, new members class, I'm going to begin one in the beginning of February, and I'll be sending out an invitation to several people who are on our rolls. But if you would like to join that, uh, please send me an email or give me a call. and be glad to get you involved in that class that's coming up. Welcome to worship. Good morning. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Hey kids, it's good to see you this morning. Well, you're seeing me again, but I'm not really seeing you, but here we are in the sanctuary on this last Sunday of the Christmas season this year, and maybe it's the same at your house. Is, is your Christmas tree still up or has it already been taken down? Have you got your decorations around the house or have you already put those away? Well, sadly, it's time to put them away here at church too. Um, I'm in the church because this is winter and I'm wearing a, a winter coat in the church. It's so cold. So it seems like it should still be the Christmas season, but it's moving on and it's time to take down our decorations. So I've got the box here in front of me and just like you do at home, I'm going to start putting these beautiful decorations in the box in front of me. And don't you feel sad when you do that? I always feel sad. I'm probably the last one in our house who wants to take down the decorations because it's such a special time of year, right? It's a, it's a beautiful time of year, but it's time. 
and so we, we start taking these down. But the good news is that Christmas is not really about the decorations and the tree and all of that. Those are ways that we celebrate something that's always true, that never goes away, that doesn't get packed up in a box and put away and forgotten until the next year. What we celebrate at Christmas, and we use these decorations and the tree and all of these things to celebrate, what we celebrate is true all the time. It's true forever. And so you don't have to uh, think that Christmas is gone just because the decorations are gone. It's, it's a truth about our lives that Jesus has come, that Jesus has come into our life and he is our Lord. And so we celebrate every single day who Jesus is. And even if we do put these away, uh, and it's a good thing we do because, you know, the tree would get dried out and turn brown. And of course, maybe you have a plastic tree, so that looks okay, but it would get dusty and it would have to be cleaned and all kinds of things like that. But it's a special, de special time of year when we celebrate something that is always true. And that is that God has loved us enough to send us his son, Jesus, to be our savior. And so go in God's love today and we'll see you soon in the next season of the Christian year. Okay, jo please join me in this litany, the celebration of Jesus' baptism. O Christ, by your epiphany, your light shines upon us, giving us the fullness of salvation. Help us show your light to all we meet today. Lord, have mercy. O Christ of glory, you humbled yourself to be baptized 
showing us the way of humility. Strengthen us to serve you in humility all the days of our life. Lord, have mercy. O Christ, by your baptism, you cleansed us from our sin, making us children of your Father. Give the grace of being a child of God to all who seek you. Lord, have mercy. O Christ, by your baptism, you sanctified creation and opened the door of repentance to all who are baptized. Make us servants of your gospel in the world. Lord, have mercy. O Christ, by your baptism, you revealed to us the glorious Trinity when the voice from heaven proclaimed, This is my beloved Son. And the Holy Spirit descended upon you like a dove. Renew a heart of worship within all the baptized. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, you anointed Jesus at his baptism with the Holy Spirit and revealed him as your beloved son. Keep us, your children born of water and the Spirit, faithful in your service, that we may rejoice to be called children of God. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please join with me reading the gospel lesson from Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 to 11. It's a new translation that I'm not familiar with, but it fills the uh, meaning very, very well. It's from the Message Translation. And we'll start with, chap with verse 4. John the Baptist appeared in the wild preaching a baptism of life change that leads to forgiveness of sins. People thronged to him from Judea and Jerusalem, and as they confessed their sins, were baptized by him in the Jordan River into a changed life. John wore a camel hair habit tied at the waist with a leather belt. He ate locusts and wild field honey. 
As he preached, he said, the real action comes next. The star in this drama, to whom I'm a mere stagehand, will change your life. I'm baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life, his baptism, a holy baptism by the Holy Spirit will change you from the inside out. At this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. The moment he came out of the water, he saw the sky split open and God's Spirit, looking like a dove, came down on him. Along with the Spirit of voice, you are my son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. And our second reading is from Acts, chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. Now, it happened that while Apollos was away in Corinth, Paul made his way down through the mountains, came to Ephesus, and happened on some disciples there. The first thing he said was, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did you take God into your mind only, or do you also embrace him with your heart? Did he get inside you? We've never heard of that. A Holy Spirit? God within us? How were you baptized then, said Paul? In John's baptism. That explains it, said Paul. John preached a baptism of radical life change so that people would be ready to receive the one coming after him who turned out to be Jesus. If you've been baptized in John's baptism, you are ready now for the real thing, for Jesus. And they were. As soon as they heard of it, they were baptized in his name of the Master Jesus. Paul put his hands on their heads, and the Holy Spirit entered them. From that moment on, they were praising God in tongues and talking about God's actions. Altogether, there were about a dozen a dozen people there that day. If you have followed the news beyond the really big stories that are going on in our world right now, the pandemic, of course, and our nation's political mess, you might have heard about a very strange happening in some remote locations around the globe. Do you remember the classic science fiction movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey? Well, just like in that movie, strange monoliths have been found in remote wilderness locations, starting in Utah, and then in Romania, of all places. And there was one found in Colombia. We even had one here in California, but I don't think it was legitimate. Many of the monoliths just seem to be clearly practical jokers taking advantage of the attention to that very first, more mysterious monolith in Utah. Whatever the origin of these monoliths may be, what I find fascinating is just how quickly a single mysterious appearance of a piece of metal standing in the Utah wilderness became worldwide news alongside the huge news stories that are actually affecting us every day. John the Baptist seemed to capture the imagination and the attention of the people of Israel by a similar model to those monoliths. He appeared in the wilderness, but his strange appearance caught the attention uh, of someone and it quickly spread to become national news in Israel so that people began flocking out into the wilderness to see John in all of his strangeness and to hear him speak. John was not a silent monolith, however, keeping his mysteries hidden. No, 
John was as loud as they come, declaring God's great mysteries that were about to be revealed. Isn't it strange that the story of our faith is so often a story taking place on the remote fringes of world events and places? Israel, as a nation, was already a remote fringe of the great Roman Empire. But John appeared in Israel's wilderness, the fringe of the fringe. He did not appear in Jerusalem, the capital city, which was substantial, but still a fringe city, but it probably had about 55,000 people. And during the major feasts of the Jewish calendar, the city would even swell up to about 180,000 people. But John wasn't found there in the city. He was out in the wilderness. People had to go out to him. Likewise, Jesus appeared in the remote northern corner of Israel around the Sea of Galilee. He spent most of his time in the small villages and the surrounding country and only entered Jerusalem for Israel's great religious feasts. People went out to find Jesus. First, the crowds had gone out to hear John's message and to receive his baptism. This baptism was a further step for those people who had made the commitment, for those who had gone to the effort of finding John out there in the wilderness to hear him speak and then to respond by entering the cleansing waters of baptism and rising up out of those waters to live a new kind of life, a life committed to God. This was preparation, John said, for something or actually someone even greater who is about to appear. And that someone greater, of course we know, was Jesus. When the people went out to the wilderness to hear Jesus speak, they discovered that while they had made some effort to walk out to find him, God had also walked to meet them. And in fact, God had walked right into their lives. I think there is a reason that these things happened in the wilderness and not in the centers of population and power and commerce. John and Jesus call us to put aside the distractions and the demands of life and to walk with God. So that even if we have to return to live in those population centers, you know, like Fort Bragg, where we make our living, we return to these great centers shaped now and transformed by God's will and by God's spirit. John taught and baptized the people to follow God's will, and Jesus baptizes us with God's Spirit, who works from within us to transform our lives. Actually, I want to suggest that God's Spirit does not uh, so much work within us, like a carpenter who is trying to build something, as he does walk within us. I know that some of you are avid walkers, some of you go as a group and walk on the coastal path together. I've seen you out there, and I know that you are not only walking out there together side by side, but you are out there talking and building relationship. You are walking and have created an interrelational experience of familiarity and of mutual love with those that you walk with. This is exactly what God's Spirit does with us. And the experience of walking with God over the years is a transformational experience. I want to take that walking together image even a little further. In the history of Christian theology, the relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Trinity, is a relationship described with this beautiful, but albeit very technical term. That relationship is described as a perichoretic union. That just rolls off the tongue so elegantly, doesn't it? What that phrase describes is the kind of intimacy shared by the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. An intimacy that is like 
walking or dancing inside of one another. The three persons of the Trinity are together one God through this perichoresis, uniting them as one being. When Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, he is inviting us into that eternal dance of the Trinity. This is what we hear Luke describing in our passage from Acts. When he writes, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did you take God into your mind only, or did you also embrace him with your heart? Did the Spirit get inside of you? <clears throat> God wants to walk and dance inside of you, and as you walk with God, you will discover that his Spirit will begin transforming your life. So you may picture the relationship as walking together with God's Spirit on our beautiful coastal trail in an intimate conversation with God who is our friend. Or, if you have more skill than I do on the dance floor, you may picture the relationship as moving together with God's Spirit in an elegant dance, where God, of course, is taking the lead. Together, your movement creates a work of beauty. The union that God is hoping to create with you is like that union enjoyed even between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit themselves. Listen to this striking prayer that Jesus speaks in John chapter 17, his gospel, verses 20 to 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This is God's hope for each of us. Consider this, God's Spirit is right now ready to walk with you, even more, to walk within you. You may need to put aside the distractions and go out to the wilderness where you can hear this call to a new life. But God's hope is not just for you to obey a set of rules. God's hope for you is to walk and even dance into ever greater unity and love. So, I pray that you may walk with God's Spirit this year, throughout the year, inside of you, throughout your life. God bless. Almighty God, creator of all things visible and invisible, we are not a people of great world influence, but we have grieved this week as we watched the mobs assault our nation's capital and violently destroy property and pose for congratulatory selfies as if they were conquering liberators in those halls of public service. We grieve the stark divisions in our nation and we pray for healing of our land. We pray for wisdom for the new administration to restore civility, dignity, and mutual respect. We pray for peace in our land where so many have brought 
have bought into radical conspiracies and who flippantly consider civil war and who build private arsenals to defend or to attack their neighbors. We are living in unprecedented times for our nation. Help us to live wisely as Christians who follow the Prince of Peace. We thank you for the more simple pleasures that we enjoy. We thank you for the connections that we make with you through the material world of your creation. We are baptized not in some esoteric and mysterious way, but in the simple, refreshing, and cleansing waters of your creation. We enter into communion with you as we eat the simple elements of bread and wine. We encounter you, as St. Francis reminds us, in the sun and moon, and in the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. We see your face, as Mother Teresa taught us, in the eyes of the poor and the suffering in the world. We give you thanks, Lord, that we are everywhere surrounded by your presence and that we live in a world of your making. Make us mindful of this simple truth whenever we begin to think of the world or of the things of this world as our own property or whenever we imagine that we are a self-made people. We are yours and we rejoice in that truth. Give us confidence to trust in you in all things and at all times. When destructive forces seem to be undermining the peace that you intend for the world, take away our fear. Take away our fear when we experience pain or illness in the body, knowing that our bodies are not our own, but they are a part of your creation, and you are redeeming all things through Christ. We pray now for those who are facing difficult times in our community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we sing joyfully the words that Jesus has taught us to pray.
Now receive this benediction from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, where Paul writes, Now to the one who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or imagine, to God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.